Good evening. Welcome to Calvin University and Calvin Theological Seminary. My name is Jewel Maidenblick, and I'm blessed to serve as president of Calvin Theological Seminary. On behalf of Calvin University President Michael Leroy, who you will hear from in just a few minutes, and on behalf of faculty, staff, students, and our respective board members, we are so glad they have chosen to attend or listen in to the 2022 Kuiper Prize Award Ceremony. The Kuiper Prize was established in 1996 and is named after Dutch theologian Abraham Kuiper. The Kuiper Prize is awarded each year to a scholar or community leader whose outstanding contribution to their chosen sphere reflects the ideas and values characteristic of the neo-Calvinistic vision of religious engagement in matters of social, political, and cultural significance in one or more of the spheres of society. Abraham Kuyper, who was born in 1837 and died in 1920, was one of the most extraordinary individuals of his time. A prolific intellectual and theologian, he founded the Free University in Amsterdam and was a person who was a pastor, educator, journalist, and an active politician, serving as a member of parliament in the Netherlands beginning in 1874, and as many of you know, ultimately serving as prime minister from 1901 to 1905. Kuiper was an advocate for those he affectionately called the little people, those who did not have a voice in the public spheres, and Kuiper desired to advocate for such persons and give them voice. Tonight, we honor, we honor someone who is also an advocate for others and gives voice to those who have suffered in this broken global community. The annual Kuiper Prize and Kuiper Conference are funded thanks to a generous grant from the late Rimmer and Ruth DeVries, who wanted Calvin to continue to express and explore critical appreciation for the legacy of Abraham Kuyper while placing that legacy within current and contemporary culture and challenges. I'm now gonna invite Dr. Matt Lumberg, who is director of the DeVries Institute for Global Faculty Development, also generously funded by the late Rimmer and Ruth DeVries to share more with us at this time. Good evening, everyone. It is so wonderful to have all of you gathered here for the conference and for this year's awarding of the Kuiper Prize. Especially with the uncertainty that we've all experienced over these strange last two years, illness and loss, of course, but also canceled events, postponed events, dare I even mention Zoom events, this time together is something we shouldn't take for granted. As President Maidenblick said, my name is Matt Lundberg. I serve as the director of the DeVries Institute for Global Faculty Development here at Calvin University. And earlier this academic year, the DeVries Institute became what we could think of as the institutional home of the Kuiper Prize and Conference at Calvin. So it's been wonderful to see more about the wonderful work that Jordan and his crew have been doing. The mission of the DeVries Institute is to help Christian scholars here at Calvin but also elsewhere around the world, to develop meaningful connections between faith and learning in all areas of academic work. And as President Maidenblick said, and you can tell from the name of the Institute, we have the late Rimmer and Ruth DeVries with their generosity, their vision for Christian higher education. We have them to thank for the possibility of an Institute at Calvin to undertake this work. And as President Maidenblick also just said, we remain grateful to the DeVrieses for the way that this conference that you're enjoying right now and the prize that will be awarded tonight, how that allows us to celebrate and explore the legacy of Abraham Kuyper, as well as the broader neo-Calvinist tradition as a crucial resource for this important task of engaging in academic work and participating in all the spheres of life in a manner that is permeated by Christian faith. In addition to the DeVries family, there is someone else we need to thank this evening for his role in making this work and these events possible at Calvin. At the end of June, President Michael Leroy is stepping down after a decade of leadership at Calvin University. 
And there are so many reasons for us to be thankful to President Leroy, as well as his wife, Andrea, for what they have given of themselves to Calvin. And I trust there will be lots of opportunities over the next couple of months here at Calvin for us to name those things and to thank them for them. But this evening, unsurprisingly, I want to focus our attention on the role played by President Leroy in bringing the Kuiper Prize and Conference to Calvin and making the Diverse Institute possible. Creating initiatives like these takes vision, drive, patience. It requires the ability to look out from the terrain of the present moment toward the needs and challenges of the future. It involves conversations over long stretches of time to discover the convergence of that vision with the vision and dreams of donors and colleagues. And in the course of doing so, something new is created that provides fresh, renewed opportunities for learning and collaboration, as well as sustainable infrastructure to continue those opportunities into the future and to build new ones along the way. This is challenging work. It takes a variety of gifts and skills to do it well. And this challenging work is what President Leroy has undertaken so effectively to make this conference, this prize, and this institute possible here at Calvin, and for the benefit of Christians around the world involved in higher education and witness in the public sphere. It's of course true that many people have been involved in the formation of these initiatives at Calvin. President Leroy would be the first to draw the attention away from himself to the good and important work done by others. But he indeed played a central part. So this evening, I ask you to join me in thanking President Michael Leroy for all that he has done to bring these dreams into reality, as well as his broader faithful leadership at Calvin over the past decade. Ah, oh, shucks. I didn't, I didn't know he was going to do that, but, but thank you. I, um, I feel honored and, and humbled to be here. I also am very aware that um, I, I just play one part, and there are a lot of giants that, um, who have big shoulders, and I'm standing here in the midst of many of them, and I'm so excited. But uh, part of, I, I'll just share my joy at this gathering at the opportunity and what the future portends. The, you know, the, my joy is that prize is a wonderful way to celebrate excellent Christian scholarship, excellent Christian scholarship. And, and so we're gonna, we're gonna do that here in a minute, celebrate excellent, excellent Christian scholarship. And it also is so exciting for me to think of the ways that faculty here at Calvin, but around the world, will be um, and already are being shaped in their formation as Christian academics in their fields. And so there's just, I just have so much joy at, at uh, this moment, getting a glimpse, looking out there, seeing you, knowing that you are beneficiaries in, in many ways of, of the benevolence of the DeVries and, and actually the vision and excitement um, that I really uh, learned from you and then was able to represent. So I feel humbled and honored in this. I also know that I wouldn't be here if um, it wasn't for, be here talking about this, is if it wasn't for, I was driving my car through Michigan one day and the phone rang and I can't remember who called who, whether I called you, Jewel, or Jewel called me and he said, let's, let's have a deeper conversation with Rimmer. And, um, and really it was uh, that instigating uh, that without that kind of prompting, I'm, I'm not sure that, that I would have thought to do it. So thank you, Jewel. Well, it's my pleasure and privilege uh, to be here with you tonight. And during my time, I've seen this community unreservedly embrace its mission to equip students to think deeply, to act justly, and to live wholeheartedly as Christ's agents of renewal in the world. 
it's really been an honor to be a part of that, and it w- will continue to be an honor for me to watch um, and to uh, celebrate and to participate in the years ahead. But tonight I have a special honor of awarding the Kuiper Prize. But before I do, um, I want to also just convey thanks to uh, Jewel Maidenblick and Matt Lundberg uh, for the role they've played in, in tonight's ceremony, but also Jordan Baller. Uh, Jordan's somewhere back there, right? There you are. And um, Jordan, your, your vision and enthusiasm for this project has been um, really foundational for us to um, have been a part of really exciting things over the past several years, and I look forward to seeing more of your creativity at work. So we've been blessed here at Calvin by the depth and breadth of scholarship that's been shared by accomplished presenters over the years and award recipients. I'm really um, grateful for the opportunity this conference that this conference presents represents for all of us. And as Jewel um, stated earlier, all of this is made possible because of Rimmer and Ruth DeVries. We're so greatly uh, humbled by their decision. And under the auspices of the DeVries Institute for Global Faculty Development, we're gathered tonight to honor this year's recipient of the Abraham Kuyper Prize for Excellence in Reform Theology and Public Life. This is given annually to a scholar or community leader whose life and work exemplifies key concepts, practices, and teachings of Abraham Kuyper. And that's been a wonderful thing about this award is that it's awarded to academics and it's also to, awarded to community leaders, people that embody this, this or, or, or in some way kind of refer back to the, the life of Abraham Kuyper. And so I'm delighted to give the award this year to Ruth Padilla de Borst, a theologian, a missiologist, an educator, and a wonderful storyteller. Ruth has demonstrated what it looks like to live wholeheartedly as a globally engaged follower of Jesus. I'd heard about Ruth many, for many, many years before I was able to meet her more than 10 years ago uh, in, uh, in Costa Rica, where uh, I was a part of a student program at the university where I served previously. And I watched from the back of the classroom as she told her story and as she taught students. And then really what she led them to was an engagement a mutual form of engagement and education and transformation where they were asking questions about the context, but also asking questions in the context of relationships that, that she was a part of there in, um, in Costa Rica. And the students just came to life. There's nothing that brings students to life in their learning more than experiential form of education that I know Ruth champions. Ruth has embraced a belief in integral mission, an understanding that Christian mission involves both evangelism and social responsibility, a commitment to the gospel and a commitment to justice. Ruth has worked for decades, raising up leaders in her native Latin America. Currently, she serves with Resonate Global Mission, leading in the Comunidad de Estudios Teológicos Interdisciplinarios, I had to use some muscles I haven't used in a few weeks here. It's a learning community with students across Latin America. She also coordinates the networking team of International Fellowship for Mission as Transformation and is actively furthering missional leadership formation processes within the Christian Reformed Church in North America. And later this year, she'll be joining the faculty of Western Theological Seminary as the Richard C. Oderslice, Associate Professor of World Christianity. So we'll get the benefit of her in West Michigan for many, many days to come, many years to come. As a trusted guide in the communities where she serves, Ruth says, I can step forth with confidence, bringing the gifts of my Latin American context and communities to bear on the global church in mission, fully aware that these gifts complement those offered by diverse other communities and that only together, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, are we able to follow Jesus in living out God's good purposes for our world. Thank you for this inspiration, Ruth. We thank you for this example. We need you, and we, we uh, look forward to hearing from you tonight for this lecture. So please join me here on the stage so I can present you the award. Thank you.
Buenas noches. So, I guess some words are in order uh, in receiving this award, and I, I do receive it humbly with um, gratitude for those who shape me in life, for my parents, for my in-laws, for Jamie DeVores, who championed me as a woman um, in theology. Um, and for the communities I'm a part of currently, for Casadobe, for SETI, for the FTL, and Infimit, and uh, last but not least to my husband James. Now, really, I cannot simply deliver the lecture that I had planned tonight, because as we sit comfortably in this room, Fellow human beings are suffering unimaginable grief and trauma. Just last week, in less than 24 hours, in the tiny country of El Salvador, where we served for many years, 85 people were murdered by gangs in one day. Sri Lanka is falling to pieces. Ethiopia is torn apart. And the scenes revealed this week in Ukraine are beyond words. Such unfathomable evil. So I invite us to spare at least a little minute of our time tonight to sit silently in solidarity with the victims, in keen awareness of the darkness of our effaced humanity, of the utter depravity of a world turned against our Creator. Let's take a minute of silence. Lord, hear our inarticulate prayers and forgive us. Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Amen. As the young woman finished her chapel address and stepped away from the podium, the president of the Christian College shook her hand effusively. Thank you, that was great. You obviously know Kuiper through and through. Well, that woman was me, and I must admit that to that date, I had never read a word by the Dutch theologian and statesman. <laughs> Years later, Rimmer de Vries would complain to my husband that in a talk I offered here at an Iapchik conference, I had not once mentioned Kuiper. Tell me, he demanded, is she a Kuiperian? Imagine now my utter surprise that given that track record, <laughs> I would be the honored recipient of this year's Kuiper Prize. And I imagine several people present might rightfully join me today in questioning my bona fide credentials. After all, I grew up in a Baptist church in Argentina I ministered across Latin America with an interdenominational student ministry. The church I worked with the most in El Salvador was Pentecostal. My children were baptized in an Episcopal church. And my current congregation is an ecumenical house church in Costa Rica. Reformed? Kyperian? At the very same time, just last week, Actually, I closed more than 30-year-long stint as a missionary with the Christian Reformed Church. And in a couple months, I'll be joining the faculty at Western Theological Seminary. My shock and profound gratitude for this Kuiper Prize builds on the heartfelt appreciation I have for the gifts of the Reformed tradition 
and for many of its representatives. I can't even quote all of them, but the greatest of those gifts is my husband, without whose companionship I would not be who I am, nor would I be speaking to you today. His deep-set, world-transformative commitments were nurtured here, in the divorced family, in Christian schools, at Calvin College, with Jamie divorced, where Jamie divorced was a beloved professor. My mentor, Sidney Roy, nurtured my faith as I grew up in Argentina, and to this day exemplifies for me a gracious ecumenical spirit. Countless Reformed sisters and brothers upheld me and my children in prayer and support at the death of my late husband many years ago. Nick Walterstow, both in person and through his writing, continues accompanying my walk along with his wife, Claire. Rimmer de Vries doggedly called me every week several years back, demanding that I finish my dissertation. The list continues. I thank God for the Reform family, for the Kuyperian Strand, and for the undeserved honor I'm being granted today. May this all bring glory to God. Now, a second teaser before digging more fully into my topic. Several decades back, as I became a missionary in El Salvador, I wrote to my new colleagues in the region. I've been in interdenominational student ministry for many years, but now that I'm serving as a Christian Reformed missionary, I'd appreciate knowing what sources you found helpful in ministry that are distinctively Reformed. The field director of CRWM responded. This following citation sums up our vision as reformed missionaries, and he quoted, according to the New Testament, the whole world has been placed under the lordship of Jesus Christ. The Christian hope is related to the consummation of God's purpose to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under him as Lord and to liberate humanity from sin and death in his kingdom. The Christ whom the church acknowledges as Lord is the Lord of the whole universe. It is in the affirmation of his universal lordship that the church finds the basis for its mission. Christ has been enthroned as king and his sovereignty extends over the totality of creation. As such, he commissions his disciples to make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Now, believe it or not, the person cited was not Dutch, nor even denominationally affiliated as Reformed. It was Ecuadorian theologian and Baptist pastor, Rene Padilla. When I asked him, my father, in 2015, if he or the movement he pioneered, the Fraternidad Teológica Latinoamericana, had been influenced by Kuiper, he responded, at some point decades ago, I read a little book by Kuiper about the social, economic, and political spheres from a Christian perspective. I liked it but I cannot say it had a major influence on my thinking. And as far as I know, his thought has not been made known much in Latin America or in the FTL." End quote. Reformed? Kuyperian? Perhaps something is happening here that illustrates the title of this conference. Tongues, Tribes, and Nations global Christianity and reformed public theology. Perhaps the reality is that God's spirit and God's word reveal Christ and invite women and men from around the world into the reign of the triune God without necessarily transiting through Amsterdam, Campen, Grand Rapids, or Holland. Perhaps. With this as a problematizing prelude, I intend to explore the topic from top or bottom, reorienting public narrative. 
I will first make a case for employing story as a category more generative than worldview. I will then lay out the impact of the top-down neo-Calvinist agenda of the Gospel Coalition as a current challenge faced by the church in Latin America. And I will close with a call to embodying ex embodied expressions of the biblical story from the bottom up in the midst of the realities of Latin America and beyond. The concept of worldview as a basic belief system through which one sees the world need not be explained in this setting. Surely everyone here has heard and rehearsed its use untold times. Along with Newbigin, Goheen, Bartholomew, and many narrative theologians, I favor the concept of narrative or story as a comprehensive one, which encompasses more than a cognitive intellectual assent or doctrinal perspective. Says Smith, and I quote, for all our science, rationality, and technology, we are no less the makers, tellers, and believers of narrative construals of existence, history, and purpose than were our forebears at any other time in human history. We not only continue to be animals who make stories, but also animals who are made by our stories. We live by the stories within which we believe, understand, and experience ourselves to be embedded. We are believing agents in the plots in which we see ourselves. The issue then is into what story we read ourselves. Newbegin affirms that, quote, the Christian understanding of the world is not only a matter of dwelling in a tradition of understanding, it's a matter of dwelling in a story of God's activity, activity which is still continuing, end quote. For Christians, reading themselves into that story demands rejecting the alternative stories available in any given context at any given time. For example, current stories of consumerism, accumulation, conquest, exploitation, and competition. This challenge is issued not merely by individual Christians, but in Newbegin's words, again, quote, through the witness of a community which indwells the story the Bible tells, end quote. This community not only reads scripture, but reads itself into the story it tells. It approaches the Bible, and again, new begin, not to understand the text, but to understand the world through the text, end quote. I invite you now to travel to south of the Rio Grande to see what stories are current there and which might need to be rewritten. Eduardo Galeano, a Uruguayan poet, in multiple vol volumes traces the story of what is today known as Latin America, but I prefer to identify with the cuna term, Aviayala, the land many ethnicities share. In his book, The Open Veins of Latin America, Galliano graphically depicts the plundering of people and land on the part of colonial powers. Populated by a variegated weaving of indigenous and African, European, and Asian extract, our lands have been colonized and plundered through the centuries not only by conquering Spanish and Portuguese forces, but also by the commercial powers of Great Britain and the globalizing capitalist forces of the United States. Although the story of Christian mission has been branded by social, political, and financial interest extraneous to the gospel itself, and this has often dulled its transformative impact, God has been active in our region since creation, and there has been explicit gospel witness in the region since the arrival of Europeans. A recent arrival 
on the Latin American religious scene. And one telling a different story is the US originated New Calvinist Gospel Coalition. Again, I suspect I need not introduce this movement represented by the likes of John MacArthur, John Piper, Tim Keller, and others to this audience. What you may not know, however, is that the Gospel Coalition is heavily invested in Latin America. Social media, publications, pastoral conferences, and workshops are being very intentionally targeted on this region that has historically, uh, was historically dominated by Roman Catholicism and within which more recent Pentecostalism and Neo-Pentecostalism have gained many adherents, many of whom are prey to the manipulations of the prosperity gospel because of a void of solid biblical teaching. According to Miguel Nunez, the Dominican Republic promoter of the Gospel Coalition, the Reformation never arrived in Latin America. And I quote Miguel Nunez, Latin America needs to be re-evangelized because it has been inoculated with the wrong message. Therefore, people have developed antibodies to the real gospel, end quote. Of course, this statement begs the questions. What is the real gospel? How is it shared? Who are its trusted messengers? Nunez would solidly emphasize the Reformation solas as core of the right message. At the same time, he affirms that according to the Calvinist worldview, and I quote him again, God gave us the planet to dominate it and develop it. And quote again, the gospel reaches from the top to the bottom. So for him, the obvious messengers are the privileged, well-off, educated members of society like him. He left a thriving medical career in the US to return to the Dominican Republic, plant a church, and further the agenda of the gospel coalition. His top-down outlook is consistent with that of the movement sociologist Vermeulen titles the Reformed Resurgence. And I quote, leaders of the new Calvinism have intentionally posited themselves as institutional power brokers and the gatekeepers of orthodoxy among evangelicals, end quote. The assumption veiled by some but stated outright by others, is that they, the new Calvinists, have direct, unbiased access to scripture. And they are charged to bring theological renewal through solid biblical exposition to a people untouched by true Christianity, the message of grace, biblical inerrancy, and gender complementarianism. Now, though the influence of this movement is growing across the continent, there is disquiet among Latin American evangelicos who have historically identified with either the radical or the magisterial reformation. Burkholder, a missionary in Guatemala City, says in reference to pastors who fly the reformed flag in his context, this following, there is much zeal for healthy doctrine. At the same time, the zeal is often out of control and becomes condemnatory, end quote. This can lead to a false teaching hunt exacerbated by the use of the internet, which is likened by another neo-reform pastor to the printing press 500 years ago as ideal medium for propagating the new reformation. A group of Latin American scholars, all with PhDs in Bible or theology, were so burdened with the impact of this movement, which they identify as yet another example of theological colonialism from the North, that they gathered to produce a conference and a book, Good News Out of Latin America, 
Reflections in Honor of John Stott on the 100th Anniversary of His Birth. In that book, Colombian historian Daniel Salinas cogently undoes Nunez's argument that he and the Gospel Coalition are the ones who have been bringing the Reformation to our region only in recent years. Salinas shows that reform thinking and practice have been contributing to the life and ministry of the church for over a century. In a similar vein, historians of the Fraternidad Teológica Latinoamericana dedicated an entire volume of their regular journal to outlining the diverse expressions of Protestant witness from the very early days of our nations. Although certainly the Roman Catholic Church was the dominant form of Christianity, the social and educational impact of heirs of the Reformation is undeniable. Mexican historian Carlos Mondragón has written extensively about the social thought and impact of Protestants in matters of biblical literacy, religious liberty, the questioning of inequity, the resistance to both fascism and populism. Significant exponents of evangelical Protestantism within Latin America during the first half of the 20th century, and you will hear a little bit of Spanish here, were Mexicans Alberto Rembao, Gonzalo Baez Camargo, Ángel Mergal from Puerto Rico, Justo González of Cuba, Erasmo Braga of Brazil, Juan Barreto and Santiago Canclini of Argentina. These, along with John Mackay and John Ritchie from Scotland, where are the Scots here? Samuel Guy Inman from the US and Stanley Rycroft from England. All these people, and I quote Mondragon again, manifested a degree of homogeneity in regard to their recognition of the authority of the Bible, their Christology, their position on Catholicism, their view of popular Latin American religiosity, and their defense of religious li liberty and of democracy." End quote. According to Samuel Escobar, John Mackay demonstrated, quote, a pietistic perspective, attentive to personal conversion and cultivating a relationship with God in a life of discipled devotion, end quote. At the same time, it was his reform background that led him, again Escobar, to formulate the necessity for a social ethic such that the teacher's disciples do not only serve the victims of injustice, but also seek to correct unjust structures." End quote. A final historic citation serves to illustrate the integrative, reformed perspective of some of the early 20th century Protestant leaders. For the Evangelization Committee of 1929 Havana Congress states, in words of Baez Camargo, quote, recommended priority topics are faith in Christ as savior, repentance and generation, regeneration, that is the presentation of a living Christ who regenerates the individual's heart and at the same time transforms society, 1929. By 1970, the pioneers of the Fraternidad Teológica Latinoamericana, as I write in my doctoral dissertation, and I quote, they found in these precursors the integrated perspective they were wrestling to sustain. One that was socially engaged in Latin American reality, yet retained evangelical commitments of personal piety and respect for the authority of scripture. With that grounding, they forged ahead, developing the unlikely combination of conservative evangelical theology and a radical orientation to faith and society that would come to be known as Misión Integral, 
integral mission, end quote. Within this integral mission perspective, there is no dichotomy between the sacred and the secular, full life today and life eternal, personal piety and social responsibility, the individual and the community, care for neighbor and care for creation. Christ is Lord over all of life. In sum, neither the gospel nor a reformed perspective has been as absent in Latin America as is portrayed in the story of the Gospel Coalition, the, the story the Gospel Coalition tells. It is true that a shallow Christianity surrendered to the idols of money, success, and power is blasting its watered-down gospel from loudspeakers, flashy podiums, and social media, just as it is today in this nation. It is also true that Christendom models of political ascendancy are present in our countries, just as they are today in this nation. Yet, another story is also being lived out, a spirit-led story of faithful discipleship. There are stories today, like those ancient ones recorded in the New Testament, of simple folk who, like the widow Jesus praised, are giving everything they have in service to others. Of women serving the needy, as the woman Jesus said would always be remembered for bathing his feet with her tears. Of communities caring for people on the move, as the Samaritan woman who offered water to Jesus at the well. Of families taking in abandoned children, following the rabbi who put the child at the center, of prayer warriors who, like the approved publican, are humbly aware of their insufficiency, but count on God's forgiveness and uphold others daily. Are they Kyperian? Can they recite the tenets of Calvinism? Can they tick all the doctrinal boxes of neo-Calvinist orthodoxy? Perhaps, perhaps not. Are they living by grace, confident in God's sovereign provision, attesting with their lives that Jesus is Lord over every last dimension of their world? Most assuredly. You see, the issue as Jesus reminded the hungry crowds that followed him along the dusty roads of Judea, the issue is a matter of awareness, of listening, of seeing, of cueing in to the unlikely. Whomever has ears, do hear. Whomever has eyes, do see. See the seeds of newness God is sowing in our midst, not necessarily from the north or from the echelons of power, but from the bottom up. Kuiper himself might never have appreciated the value and relevance of Calvin's teaching if he had not listened intently to the peasants and workers of his day. Within the biblical story, true gospel witness in the world does not rest on power or the structures of Christendom, but on sharing in the passion of Jesus. Newbegin spells it out clearly, and I quote him, the very heart of the biblical vision for the unity of humankind is that at its center is not an imperial power, but the slain lamb, end quote. Consequently, the central reality in witness is, and I quote again, neither word nor act, but the total life of a community enabled by the Spirit to live in Christ, sharing his passion and the power of his resurrection, end quote. Public witness as the total life of the community 
outside the matrix of Christendom. This is not, by any means, a top-down proposition. This is not simple assent to a tidy system of thought or worldview. It plunges believing actors into the nitty-gritty story of everyday common and shared life. That is what we are humbly learning day in and day out at Casa Adobe, the intentional Christian community of which my husband James and I are a part. An assorted lot of people of different nationalities, social economic status, denominational backgrounds, including refugees and political asylees, missionaries and ministers. We share everything from morning prayer to dirty dishes, a common pot to community organizing, music nights to composting. Together, we're seeking to live an alternative story to the dominant one, marked as it is by individualism, consumerism, and exploitation of people and creation. Our lifestyle is public, and it inevitably raises questions. It provokes and awakens the imagination of neighbors, interns, student volunteers, and guests. And it ripples out, linking with and provoking other experiments of radical hospitality and world transformative action by the power of the Spirit. For the early followers of Jesus, followers of the way, confessing Christ's lordship over all things had ethical teeth. It spilled into personal, familiar, communal, and public realms. It set them at odds with both the religious and the political establishment of the day because it was perceived as improperly undermining privilege and challenging exclusionary social mores. They did not dictate change from above, however. They acted instead as a patient ferment, as Kreider puts it, transforming social relations from the bottom up and eventually influencing even the very Roman Empire. Women like Priscilla, Junia, Evodia, Sintiki in leadership alongside men in the church. Offerings used to buy the freedom of slaves who, as Paul exhorts Philemon, were to be treated as equals, and so on. Though it was not all smooth sailing, the early household congregations took seriously their commitment to follow a Lord who did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but became human, and even took on death in order to break the power of evil and bring about reconciliation. They confess Christ's Lordship from the bottom up with their lives and even with their death. In conclusion, today we are confronted by the appalling consequences of humanity's thirst for power, the ravages of war, the precipitous deterioration of our common home, the millions of uprooted people wandering deserts and dying in oceans. We can plug our ears with our doctrinal squabbles and split hairs over theological nuances, dotting I's and crossing T's. We can naively support current theological colonialisms like the Gospel Coalition's work in Latin America because of their alleged loyalty to the Reformed cause. Or we, especially those of us for whom theologizing, teaching, and writing are our daily bread we can heed the Lord's words to the religious bureaucrats of his day and of ours. And you might not recognize this, but it is a text from Matthew 23. The religious scholars and Pharisees are competent teachers in God's law. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. Their lives are perpetual public shows. They love to sit at the head table at church dinners, basking in the most prominent positions, 
preening in the radiance of public flattery, receiving honorary degrees or prizes, and getting called doctor and reverend. I've had it with you. You are hopeless, you religious scholars, you Pharisees, you theologians and church leaders, you hypocrites, for you tithe meticulously, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out the net, but swallow a camel. End quote, Jesus. Can we stand admonished, pull out our sound blocking earphones, and truly listen? Listen to sisters and brothers from below who are not insulated from the impact of centuries of exploitation of land and people on the part of colonial powers. Listen to the scientists who are photographing the current condition of our planet. Listen to the artists that name death, lament, and stir our imagination. Listen to the emerging generations who are questioning what world we are handing down to them. Sit at the feet of people whose faith is sustaining them through unimaginable suffering. Learn from indigenous communities whose lifestyle is far more respectful of the rest of creation than is our urban consumer society. Can we listen? My prayer is that as we listen, we may undergo new conversions and that by God's unending grace, we may be ushered afresh into the old story of God's upside down kingdom. May our lives and voices be added to that of every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, singing the hymn we know as Revelation 5 to the one who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. So we, we do have time uh, for some questions and discussion. Raise your hand and I'll bring it over. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Uh, gracias. Um, I've, well, there are more um, observations, but that I'd really like to hear your thoughts on, more so than questions. Uh, the first is to do with looking for narrative as the solution to the problems of worldview. So I think if we consider worldview to be the, the mental ascent to a, a neat package of abstract points, I think that's a really, that kind of worldview is a really problematic notion. I don't think it works very well. And that is the American evangelical um, account of what worldview is. Um, but we're using a lot of transport metaphors at this conference, as you did as well. So if, if the train does transit in Amsterdam or in Kampen, I think there you find a very different account of worldview to what it became in America. And, and actually, if you read Herman Bavinck or Johann Herman, it looks like narrative, that it's the unfolding of one's own narrative in a life towards God. So if, if it's not an American concept of worldview, um, is the narrative versus worldview, um, or does, does that way of trying to deal with the problem still uh, stand? So that's my first one, and I'd just I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. And the second is, so you spoke a lot about the new Calvinists, N-E-W, so figures like John Piper, John MacArthur, 
Um, but I think probably most of the people in this room would say, yeah, we're not that either. We're neo-Calvinists, N-E-O. So I'm really curious to know, again, are there, is, does, is the neo a solution to the new, for example, in some of the problems that you've been describing? Right, and those distinctions are, are, are really right on. However, how are things received, perceived, experienced by people who would not know the difference between the European-based and the US-based, or the neo and the new, when both of those in Spanish are nuevos, um, um, and the reality that even just the tag reformed, even, um, I'm sure many of the, our, our ancestors um, in the reform tradition, Calvinist or neo-Calvinist, would be squirming in their graves if they heard what is being done and said in the name of reformed tradition. And that is extremely problematic. And so when I tell people in Latin America, I'm going to teach at Western Theological Seminary, it's a reformed seminary, you mean you are going to teach, is Piper teach there? Okay, because there, there isn't all the savviness and all the parsing out of all the differences. And so it is more of a, just this need to say, what are we and what are we not? And what do we stand for and what do we not stand for? And to be aware of these variances that are taking place and are actually being extremely divisive and um, problematic in the churches across the entire continent of south of the border here. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thanks for a great lecture, Ruth. Um, is there any relationship or connection point with some dimensions of the growing Pentecostalism and, and the people that you speak, what we're speaking about? Because I'm just curious, given this, the, its size, its, its momentum, I'm just curious about any connections with, 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 those, with those traditions, is, I guess is what I would say. Because obviously there's the prosperity dimension of it, but are there other trajectories uh, of, of the Pentecostal movement that, where, where you see a possible, potential constructive uh, connection? Yes, I was sharing over lunch with a few colleagues. Um, uh, when I was sent to El Salvador, I was sent to work with Reformed churches, um, but uh, they were very small, very insignificant in the bigger picture of church life in El Salvador, but by God's provision, I ended up befriending and accompanying the pastor of one of the largest churches in the entire world. is a Pentecostal church, Mission Cristiana Elim, Elim Christian Mission. They actually have branches up in many cities. There might even be one in Grand Rapids at this point. Um, and it's a Pentecostal church, but their theology has increasingly broadened into a deep reformed commitment because of the formation processes we engaged with them. Um, so they identify as a Pentecostal reformed church in El Salvador with 130,000 members, a couple people. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ruth. Very rich and stimulating paper. I'm thinking about John Stott a little bit. I don't know if you read Godly Ambition, the biography. Okay. Um, the biographer tries to make the case that John Stott's formation in sort of the elite boarding school world really shaped him for the rest of his ministry. And that seems so different than the bottom up vision um, that you're mentioning here. And um, I know he was very shaped by your family and very willing to listen in spaces that others weren't. So if you haven't read the biography, I suppose I'm just asking for general reflections mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. 
top down versus bottom up? And do you see any spaces for elite kinds of engagement or does that in general cause you suspicion? Right, he's a fantastic example because he had an incredibly privileged formation, came from a very wealthy family, graduated from Cambridge University, had all these tools, but his choices were other. He lived in a tiny little apartment, a one bedroom apartment in London, had a couple suits he rotated from the dry cleaner probably, um, an incredibly simple lifestyle and chose to give away every last penny he made with all the royalties from his publications. And today, many of us have benefited as scholars in publications and preaching seminars around the world because of the foundation he set up, the Langham Partnership International. And so I think the issue isn't is there privilege? Yes, there's privilege and opportunity in the world. And all of us are among that elite. The question is what we do with it and who we listen to. Do we listen to the people that say, oh, well, you deserve it. And actually, you should just rest comfortably in, your, in, 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 those, in that privilege. Or, or do we need to listen to the cries of the world, to the groans of God's people, of God's creation, and then make the choices according to that, to what we hear. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I will speak from Polish perspective and I, uh, I have similar and different problem than you. I'm reformed myself, although Baptist, so as a fellow Baptist, I'm, I'm very proud of your upbringing. <laughs> uh, um, but I, I have, so on the one side I'm reformed in my theology, but on the other side when I look at people like uh, MacArthur mostly, because actually I like Keller and Piper also somehow, but MacArthur, he's very, he's very active in Eastern Europe. And indeed, I would say we have problems as Reformed people in Eastern Europe to actually, not with his theology as such, I mean, maybe with the dispensational part of it, but, but my point is that the worst people are the people with good theology and wrong attitude. And I think this is actually what causes problems. And, and I think this is maybe the problem that you raised, so not necessarily with the theology as such, but the, the, the package or the, the, you know, the attitude that somehow is um, mixed with it. So that's just my Polish reflection. I know where you would like to re respond to it. But. Well, what comes to mind is simply the, the citation from Matthew 23. I mean, Jesus says, yeah, listen to them. I mean, they have some good stuff to say, but don't do what they're doing. Um, and so I think that the, the, the search for all of us is to humbly bring those things together. We can have orthodoxy, but we must have orthopraxis and orthopathos. And those three need to be woven together. Um, not because we're going to win heaven uh, because we don't deserve God's grace, but we do need to live in light of God's grace. And, and show it to the world. With that, join me in uh, congratulating Ruth again and thanking her for this evening. <laughs>